Following the death of Queen Elizabeth 10 days ago, on the Thursday, the 8th of September, most churches had last Sunday a service to commemorate her life, to thank God for, her, for the things that she'd done, to mourn for the loss of, to her immediate family and mourn the loss to the nation as a whole, remembering the good that she has done in her life a commitment that she made at the age of 21 to serve the people, a commitment that carried, over, carried on for over 70 years. Remarkable, isn't it, how a lady in her 90s was able to undertake so much, so many engagements, to bring a loss to so many. We decided as a Kirk that we would move that service of thanksgiving from last Sunday to today, because as you remember last Sunday, we had people coming from all sorts of places to remember those from this parish who had passed away during the COVID outbreak and to dedicate the Rose Garden. So today we're going to be thinking about the life of Queen Elizabeth, thinking about her motivation, thinking about the basis of her life over a long period. There are many passages of scripture that could be applied to her and her life. Many passages that were a basis of her life. And one aspect of the Queen's life that struck me most was her reliance, her total reliance on God. Whatever she did and however she did it, she was always basing her words and her actions on her belief in her God. A belief that was unshakable. A belief that kept her focused on what was important in life. Worship of her God was very important to her. Following her God was very important to her. God was the rock on which she built her life. So I've chosen the first part of Psalm 93, 95, which you've just heard read as a way of looking back, not just on her, but on the many people who have put their faith in God, who have used her, who have used that ability of God to provide a rock in their lives. I do know and I'm aware that Queen Elizabeth used to refer to Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, as her rock. But the psalm also talks about other aspects of life. It talks about joy, the joy of worshipping God, to come before him with thanksgiving, for he is great, he is our God, and we are his people. It seems to me that whatever she did, her Christian faith shone through. She served her people to the best of her abilities. She encouraged them and times of trouble. I never met the Queen. I haven't even seen the Queen in person. I've only seen her on television. But to me, her faith shone out like a beacon. And yesterday, with six other people, I walked to Lunkerty along the riverbank. Definitely a mistake. I feel as stiff as anything this morning. On a reflective walk, thinking about going with the flow and going against the flow. And one of my fellow walkers had met the Queen, I think on two occasions. And she spoke about her attributes, her friendliness, her humbleness. And this lady was obviously being touched. I don't know how long she met her for, might have only been a minute or two. But she was obviously touched by her heavenly attributes that shone through. Psalm 95 is a song of contrasts. It has good and bad in it, side by side in its 11 verses. The commentators are divided about its use, but it celebrates what God has done for his people and how they wandered away from him. Some commentators suggested that it was used at the Feast of Booths, which is in October, which is sort of equivalent to our harvest festival um, season. Other commentators suggest that it was a psalm that was sung by pilgrims, 
pilgrims who approached the temple for a festival. A sort of uh, entrance liturgy, if you like, where people progressed from outside the temple through the courts of the Gentiles up to the entrance of the priestly court, which contained the altar of sacrifice and the Holy of Holies. Later it was used as a call to worship in the synagogues, spoken by a priest or a Levite to the Israelites as they started to worship God in the service. Just as I used it as part of our call to worship this morning. The psalm was not only used in the processional entrance, but it also served as an entrance into the presence of God. One of the interesting facts I found about the psalm is that it starts on a joyful note and then gets a bit more dismal as it goes, whereas the vast majority of psalms, it's the other way around. It starts on a more dismal note and moves into a joyful part at the end. But that's just one of those things that fascinate people like me. Often in the Old Testament, good news and bad news sit side by side. The good news is that God loves his people, cares for his people, and protects his people. The bad news is this protection isn't unconditional. It depends on us being obedient and following the rules. If we are rebellious, then judgment will follow, just as night follows day. Psalm 95 reads rather like an expansion of the preceding Psalm 94, at least the last two verses. And the final two verses say, of Psalm 94 say, The Lord has become my stronghold, my rock, the rock of my refuge. He will repay them for their iniquity and wipe them out for their wickedness. The image of God as a rock has become familiar. A rock is something that is constant, that doesn't move, that doesn't shift with the tide or the wind, stays as an immovable object, an anchor, something you can put your trust in. Yesterday during my walk down the Tay, I saw a number of boats anchored in the river fishing. And one of them had anchored himself in such a way that as the boat drifted downstream, he could pull on a rope and pull himself back, using that anchor fixed at the bottom of the, uh, at the, bottom of the, um, the river. And two of my grandsons are climbers, which terrifies me, but that's another story. They attach ropes to the rock at the top of a cliff, and up they climb. They need to be convinced that that rock is stable that the rope will not move, that they will be safe. Verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 95 serve as a call to worship, as I used at the beginning of this service. Come, let us raise a joyful song to the Lord, a shout of triumph to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving and sing psalms of triumph to him. This is the portion of the song that would have been sung as they approached the temple, because the Israelites believed that God lived in the Holy of Holies, in the temple itself. Verses 3, 4, and 5 say that God's loving care is rooted in creation, which is seen as a dynamic, ongoing process, rather than a one-off activity. And verses 6 and 7 encourage the hearers to start their worship of God to come into God's presence where people will find protection. And the psalmist uses the imagery of the shepherd and his flock, which is repeated throughout the Bible. Jesus was, should be is, is known as the good shepherd. And he used the metaphor himself once, at least. Does this psalm reflect Queen Elizabeth's majesty? I think it does. She worshipped God in different places, at different times, in different types of church. But her messages always say that God was in control of her life. She would serve him and she would serve his people whenever and however she could. She was always thankful for the support that she got 
And although she was a queen, she realised that there was a higher authority. I have not watched much of the proceedings over the last few days on the television. But the bits I have watched, I've been struck by how much she was loved and respected by the general population. I sat glued to one part where there were people were filing past the coffin. And they had, you had people in dark suits, and black ties. You had people in uniform, army, navy, scouts, guides, even in school uniform. And I also saw people in jeans and a t-shirt, all who had queued for hours and hours just to walk past the coffin. I believe she was an example of God's love, which she reflected out into the world, even to people who did not know her. So what does this psalm and this wonderful lady say to us today? Firstly, the psalm says that we should worship our God with joy. It's not a sad faith, but we have a God who is with us at all times of our lives. The queen had this faith, and she reflected it out into the world with her cheery demeanour. Secondly, the psalm says our faith and trust should be unshakable, that God has been our rock, that God is our rock, and God will be our rock in the future. We need to trust him. He looks after us, whatever the problems, whatever the issues. He wants us to trust him, to lean on him, to rely on him. Because if we don't, our lives will not be complete and that relationship will crumble. He finds it hard to help a person who's ignoring him, who wants to go his own way. He gave us free will so we could choose, either with him or against him. The, cre the queen reflected this, and it was a notice, notable that even just a couple of days before her death, God was giving her the strength to do her duty, irrespective of the cost to her. God is still there supporting and guiding us. However difficult the situation gets, he is our rock, a rock on which we can depend, a rock that we should be ever thankful for. Let us worship God with joy and trust in him completely. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these few verses from Psalm 95 that encourage us to trust you because you are a rock on which we can hang anchor ourselves. And we promise that we will worship you to the best of our ability for the rest of our days. We ask these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen.